Start the recording. Yep. Good to go. All right. Well, uh, thanks, uh, thanks everyone for joining here again in another forecast builder webinar. Going here about well, now about every every three weeks um, for uh, for these webinars. Uh, this one will be a little bit, I think, a little bit different tune from the last couple where we've been discussing a lot of a lot of tech stuff. Um, this one will kind of deviate a little bit off of that. Um, in terms of the topics, as always, we'll hit some positive news and some stuff from science, science related. Uh, talk a little bit about what happened at uh, AMS. Um, talk a little bit about diurnal um, because I know that there's still some issues going on there. Uh, look, we'll look at uh, some feedback uh, that we've uh, accumulated here over the last uh, couple months and kind of run through that. And then a brief overview of some pop verification we did here, uh, just kind of over uh, our you know, lacrosse area domain just for, just for kicks. And then uh, offer up some open discussion for some Q&A from, from everyone there. So in positive news, uh, geez, it seems like it's been a long time ago now, that ice storm back uh, in mid-January. Um, but it did grab some snapshots from the big, uh, just for ice accumulation forecast. I was <laughs> very impressed uh, for, during some of this time, I just just to, just to watch, I had the Pleasant, Pleasant Hill uh, in, in configuration service uh, service backup just to kind of watch ISC and look at storm total ice amounts and I was just impressed about how seamless the ice accum was I don't have an image from the ice accum for uh, from that uh, but you know it was like down to the hundredth of ice accum uh, it's just amazing I mean you even see that with these totals coming out of the out of the big now this one image goes uh, is ice accum all the way up to zero Z January 15th. The uh, event continued past there, especially out in Dodge City's area. So uh, here's another one uh, that came from the mid shift on January 13th. And uh, a, a good chunk there of you know, central western Kansas uh, was involved with the ice, you know, in the ice storm area too. And I know Dodge City's area got over, you know, over, I think, over three quarters of an inch in spots, and that something that was interesting in this uh, in this event was uh, you know some of the heavier you know heavier rain you know heavier rain or freezing rain I should say that that fell and you look at some of the ASOS like the ASOS ice accumulation and it definitely shows that runoff uh, characteristic that you didn't end up with as much you know it wasn't a one to one ratio between QPF and ice accum it was you know, quite a bit less than that, uh, and you know, the the Fram was nicely taking that into account uh, with the ice accum. I know there was some stuff that hit Spring hit Springfield with some thunderstorms and freezing rain, and it like there was like an inch of Q, uh, of QPE, but there was maybe a tenth or so of ice accum, uh, just again a function of runoff uh, playing a role. There was some snowfall with the event as well, not a whole lot. Uh, but you know, separating out that snow and ice accum, and yet we still end up with pretty darn consistent uh, uh, snowfall out of it. So again, that was re you know really nice, uh, uh, really nice to see. So I look back at two of you know where we've come over the last uh, you know couple months here with the uh, project. Uh, something that was really interesting that came out of this uh, last tech order because it. You know, there were big changes with respect to how the pops were going to be, uh, you know, initially, you know, put in the for, for the, in Super Blend and the Forecast Builder Con that, you know, we demand <laughs> the, the starting point to be consistent. You know, there was feedback from offices that were testing out the new tech order and from the uh, other offices, like we can't, you know, things aren't matching up, and you know, I think, you know, I think that's something huge uh, that, you know, we're you know where we've come, <laughs> and another thing is, is that we demand now consistent snow and ice. That's been a big, I, I think, uh, a big change. You know, people would people be asking, you know, why aren't why aren't my snow and ice accumulations matching up? Uh, 
certainly, if your office hasn't completed that latest uh, that latest tech order, the uh, number shown shown there on the screen uh, that goes through the ITOs and ESAs, uh, you know, as soon as possible, you know, get that you know get that done because there's uh, of course pop pop differences that appear that if you don't have that uh, don't have that in. And certainly, if you complete the tech order and you're still seeing pop differences, maybe it's something related to a common theme seems to be something with Moss Guide, or there could be there could be Canadian model data issues. Uh, I know Central Region you know, is still working on a little bit of that with respect to the LDM feed. Uh, again, post a note on that on that again the CRG Matt NWS chat room, and we'll get you all squared away. Hopefully, <laughs> um, and also, you know, if you look at the project so far, project slash experiment so far, um, there's been about 50 changes that have been pushed through, uh, you know, based on a variety of feedback or proposals, such as the weighted QPF pop technique provided by the Northern Plains Sioux community, uh, brought in the digital aviation services because of demand there to get it in. Uh, pop improvements for Superblend because there was this low bias and we had plenty of feedback on it so we got that in and this of course is latest tech order. Um, there was stuff about cons raw for using that over marine areas for wind because it was performing, performing better. Uh, brought in the, you know, the freeze and spray procedure used over the Great Lakes. Ver variety of FRAM upgrades uh, over the last uh, couple tech orders you know, and more. And uh, the only tech thing here I want to talk about, so, you know, development continues here. Uh, if you look at the um, spread, you know, spreadsheet of where we're, uh, you know, where things are going, I mean, you can see I still have a list of <laughs> a variety of things to put in. You know, something big that, you know, I'm trying to work on right now is the getting, bringing in this new thing called Hazard Builder in. It'd be a nice SA tool. More information will be coming out um, after that, but, you know, Still got lots of things on the based on feedback from variety of uh, variety of you out there. Um, stop, uh, into the into the science department here. Uh, can I talk a little bit about sleet because uh, you know there's been some questions about how sleet is formed from the top down approach in the in, in forecast builder in the background, probably weather type. Um, and some, confu some confusion about that, so I kind of wanted to spend a little bit of time discussing this. There are three, um, three ways that sleet can be produced. The first, and this is what I think a lot of people think about with, with ice pellets, is that it's a refreeze of rain process. So when you're, you know, or refree yeah, refreeze of rain, so that basically, you know, when your max wet bulb aloft gets, uh, is greater than three Celsius, uh, you know, that allows, that, that ensures basically hydrometeors are in a liquid form, and then they drop into that cold layer and refreeze. Um, that, that's one, uh, one way, again, to get sleet. And sleet and ice pellets can kind of be interchangeable here in terms of name. There's a second one is a partial melt-in from when you get a near isothermal scenario. Something we noticed, you know, due to, you know, when you get, a profile that's hovering right around the the freezing line, um, you know, for a kind of a deep layer, say from the max wet bulb off, which is again assumed to be 2,000 feet above the ground or higher, and you're in that 0 to 1C, and that temperature is below 37. That 37 is that default that you see in the step four. Um, you'll get 100% probability in this situation to not just sleep, but snow and liquid. Again, that's a that's a profile where anything can happen. Uh, so everything's thrown in there. Call that a wintry, you know, a true wintry mix situation. And then there's the third, which is uh, probably the most common uh, common way is a a partial incomplete melting. So that snow that snow starts to melt around the edges, and you get maybe it's considered a um, a, a, a snow grain or something similar. So we'll just Put it in that category of um, category of sleet. In fact, uh, I know some people have asked about the definition, so I did I did go through and 
pull up a definition of fleet out of the AMS glossary, which redirects you basically to ice pellets, and uh, <laughs> for the heck of it. And uh, you know, the main thing here is that it's either re it's either freezing of raindrops, which is that prob refreeze fleet uh, idea, or you know, it's refreezing of lar largely melted snowflakes. So there's some snowflake that's you know still you know some some part of it still exists, and then there's you know grains of ice, ice or snow grain kind of stuff, you know. So there's a whole big section encompassed within the whole fleet. And so that's why this is, I would say, the most common. And that's why in the in the temp max wet bulb loft temperature curve here, um, you kind of get a maxima of fleet in that 2 to 3C range. And really, I mean, even though we have this 100% of fleet probability, there's also other probabilities for other types in here as well, your snow and your liquid stuff. So um, you ba basically between one and one and three and a half or so centigrade, it's really a wintry, <laughs> that, that wintry mix uh, idea. Uh, there's a section in the top, from back from the uh, training that everybody did the, in the top-down science training, about 9.15 or nine, 9 minutes and 15 seconds in, Really talks goes into all the varieties of way, uh, ways here that fleets produced. Uh, so I wanted to again bring this up. I think at this moment uh, I'd like to actually open it, open it up for if anybody has any questions on this again because I know there's been you know talking with people on that um, it sounds like there could be questions on it. So yeah, just raise your hand and I'll unmute, unmute you if you have questions. All right. Well, I'm not not seeing any, so uh, I will uh, I will con I will continue on. Staying in the P-type department, uh, coming back from that. Ice, ice storm event uh, up in our <laughs> up in our region here. You know, it's kind of interesting comparing. You know, there were some thermal differences uh, about how this was all going to take shape in uh, up in Minnesota and Wisconsin. So, uh, grabbed a couple of soundings and something we definitely noticed noticed even here even here at Lacrosse forecast staff that the GFS seemed to be really cold through this whole um, this whole event uh, in our region and that is really depicted here you know this was the 12 the the 12 C GFS from I think this is Sunday the 15th um, just a small warm nose um, only with a max level of a loft of one um, whether or not you take a top-down technique or the Burgoyne idea most of this will probably end up being either in the form of uh, you know, something that snow sleep may be freezing rain department. Uh, but when you look at the actual, you know, th again, this is a wrap sound and take that for what it's worth. It's a zero, zero hour forecast. So I'm kind of trying to use this as a verification idea. That max wet bulb is more like 3.1, which favors more of a sleep freezing rain in the top down approach. And the ob, ob is actually freezing rain. Uh, so I thought that was kind of, <laughs> kind of interesting. Uh, Again, how how far off? Again, that was a 33-hour forecast from the GFS. How much difference there was in thermal profile? Now, to take a little different take on this um, is is observation. Uh, the wrap the wrap sound and you know these are zero zero-hour forecasts from from the wrap up at uh, up at Eau Claire, and uh, in both soundings, uh, it was it, it was freezing rain uh, completely at Eau Claire. The whole time period, again, I have the ice acume uh, there from the, the ice acume sensor at 0.12. I mean, both of these soundings, they have ice in the cloud of loss, so it's not like the loss of ice issue. And there's not much of a warm nose on either of these, but yet it was still it was still freezing rain. So, um, you know, is there a problem with the raft in this situation? Uh, who kn you know, who knows? But I mean, I think in these scenarios, if you know, if your surface ob is Showing, uh, you know, freezing rain and consistently freezing rain. The way that you can uh, attack this for doing this in the forecast is, you know, raise that max wet bubble loft into that, you know, 
three to four inch get you to freezing rain, or maybe that in these mountains they're not there. There should be a loss of ice, and you could look at satellite to kind of confirm that. Uh, and you could do a you could reduce your prob ice present to to zero to get yourself into a freezing rain uh, situation. Oh. Something else I know that I know that people have asked in the past to get the your European um, end of the top-down approach. And uh, late last week, uh, I think it was on Friday, uh, one of our forecasters here was pulling up some soundings from the GFS and the EC, and was like, "Man, I wish we had the uh, wish we had the more vertical levels from the EC." And this is exactly why. Um, obviously, there were. This is a. I think this is like a 96-hour forecast or something like that from both models. But the European um, in green and the GFS in red. Obviously, there's some synoptic differences, so you have some differences with the 700 and 850 temperatures. But there's a warm nose in the GFS at 825, and because we don't have that 825 vertical level from the EC, we don't get any idea of that warm nose at all. And obviously, that would be a significant implication on precipitation type. So this is just one, you know, one example of why we don't have the European in the uh, in the top down or going into the consensus. So like I say, it would be great to have, you know, 25 or maybe even 50 millibar level data <laughs> from the European to help uh, to help in this regard. Obviously, now we got the Canadian, which is in a, in a 25 millibar data to to help it to some degree. Hopefully, that you know, either the GFS or the Canadian would be in agreement with the EC to get that uh, P-type stuff in your in your forecast. Um, different, slightly different topic here. Going to the A, going to AMS. Uh, there were uh, a couple of presentations uh, given um, by a variety of people from. Uh, from Central from Central Region Headquarters, just about what we're doing with the Forecast Builder experiment here, uh, where we're using the blends and a common approach here to derive snow and ice. And uh, so, I guess if you if your office, you know, if you're especially ones that are bordering other other regions, um, you know, get get discussions about what you know what's what's going on. This is maybe a, a reason uh, a reason why uh, because there was some presentations given at AMS, but you know, based on what we've seen coming out of our snow ice grids, I mean, it's it, it's really really impressive, and I hope for most that that you know, I as well as you know everybody on the grid team is you're finding that the forecast builder is really saving you time to give you more time for DSS and all that. Something else coming out since we've had a you know these last couple of slides have talked a lot about precipitation type and uh, you know you look obviously that. Dan Baumgart, myself here, um, you know, as well as others, you know, I've been doing research on P-type, and it's 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 difficult, <laughs> I will say to say the least. And there was a presentation on this, looking at, you know, surf, you know, surface observations themselves, whether they are correct. And you know, you've got ASOSs, some are augmented, non-augmented AWOSs. There's m pink but there's issues there. The LSRs, but there could be issues there. Um, you know, there's also um, issues when you're doing this, some of this research about distance and time in between the observation and the rab. You know, I just grabbed, you know, from that December, that Christmas storm, how we had such a tight gradient. Like, if you had a rab on one side of the gradient and a surface ob just on the other side, you know, that's that's not good for your research. So, you know, um, but I think, you know, coming out of all this, you know, with the issues with surface obs and all that, you know, it, it almost drives home a point that we, you know, might need further uncertainty on, on P-type and, you know, we have, we've had this discussion uh, that especially came out of the Christmas storm when we were having some issues with the weather grids about the, uh, having that phrase wintry mix. I mean, this is a clear example why. I mean, the ice storm was a, was a, you know, from a top, you know, top down perspective was the kind of an e easy one with the Pretty strong, warm, you know, a warm layer that was really warm and, you know, nice. You know, it's just a cla you know, classic freeze and rain event that, you know, 
that we're expected to na nail it. But these more issues when you're just dealing with a slight, you know, slight warm nose, it's pretty much throw your hands up in almost every any type. And I think the, you know, our diagram for max weft bubble loft kind of just depicts that. Right? You're going to get a lot of types, and your weather grid gets really messy as a result. Um, going into uh, diurnal, uh, I should have done this more one by one. The, the, the Retha Tech order provided some uh, provided some help by switching to the national blend uh, for the diur for the curve, but it's not 100% solved to get this speckling appearance that can occur. It seems to be especially prevalent more as you go farther out in the forecast uh, as you got today four through seven. Um, you know, and, and the real reason for this is that we're trying to match your max and min T and I've been doing some digging as well as uh, some others on the on the grid team and our options are pretty limited here because there's a variety of approaches have various problems. You know, one option there is that we not enforce match in the max T min T but which will remove the speckling, uh, but then there could be a you know three plus degree differences between the max min of hourly T's and your max min T, and that's not what we want. <laughs> um, you could populate hourly hourly T every three hours, but then the question becomes, how do you modify that temp temperature after your ma if you update your max and min? Um, you know, in the end, does it end up being more grid touching? Certainly, as you go into summer months. You know, you, your curve is not linear between you know between those three hours. It's more probably of an exponential type curve. So you know, and going back to this, you know, the the, the spec one seems to be more of a non in, in a situation of non diurnal, which you know it does happen more often certainly in this fall, spring, and 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 winter. But you know, is is it worth you know, go and digging into this. So, I mean, the grid team, let's just say, is still discussing this, so we're going to keep looking at ways to solve this. I just want to bring this up because uh, I know some people have emailed about this uh, about this issue. So, know that we're still we're still working on this and trying to figure out what to do. So, all right. With that, I want to pass this over to to Chuck um, to talk about the feedback. Hey, Andy. All right. Okay. So you should. Oh, actually, no. I don't want to pass it to you. That's right, because you you want to draw. Um. Or do you? Yeah, or you I'm, have it. I'm doing this from home. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we can keep... try it. If if it. Yeah. If it fails, then uh, we can. We can switch to. Uh, we'll okay. switch back to you running it. Let okay. Me, uh... Go ahead and hit present. There. There we are. My uh, thing was hiding it there. Okay, there we are. Okay, so um, basically, uh, I'm I'm going to review the feedback we received so far. We're we're about um, well, we're over halfway through this experiment. So um, at this point of the experiment, it, it really becomes key of what our actual takeaways are from it. And one uh, big component of that is what the feedback that the forecasters are providing us. Um, we have many ways of getting feedback to us. The most direct way is the uh, a forecast builder email um, that we, we all, uh, key members of the team, receive, and we try to be as responsive as possible to that. Another way is uh, the VLAB. We have a great discussion going on in the VLAB of, of various items as well, and um, we're, we're uh, really responsive on those as well. Those go directly to our email when there's a new question or a new uh, response to, to something in, in the VLAB uh, forums. Um, and then the, the third way is a feedback that we've asked all the forecasters to fill out every shift if possible, uh, giving us a direct feedback on how that shift went when working with the, uh, with not only the uh, the forecast builder but also how the common starting point uh, forecast worked. So uh, we, we received about 800 uh, for, uh, responses so far, um, and we've got many of our great suggestions. Some of the, the 50 uh, changes that we made to forecast builder were a direct result of feedback we received in the. Uh, the feedback form in the survey itself. Um, we've added room for comments in there. Uh, the past couple of months, we've added a, that comment spot, so people can just put random comments in and, and things that does directly tie to one of the questions we've been asking or any suggestions in there. So it's, it's great to add those uh, the, the, a little more uh, discourse and, and, and narrative uh, uh, feedback uh, that we can um, uh, and analyze just a little more subjectively and not not just um, looking at, at straight yes/no up/down uh, uh, responses. 
Um, and we also have some, some positive experiences noted um, in the form as well. And that's one thing we really are looking for now would be anybody's got some uh, positive of experiences. Maybe there's a situation where by using Forecast Builder, you you actually realize a situation that might you weren't initially thinking of could be possible. And if, if, if that has occurred, I know it's occurred to me as I've been forecasting. I really uh, um, take note of that and, and, and notice that, that the, the efficiency of, uh, of our process and some of the, the, um, some of the guidance that we have going into the system really helps uh, identify some, some issues and, and some uh, weather uh, concerns that I might not have been initially aware of. So I love hearing stories about that as well. Of course, any of the uh, problems that you still have, definitely uh, bring those to our attention as well. And um, we do have some persistent problems that we're still working on. Um, and like I, I mentioned, uh, many have been addressed with those changes we've made. And uh, others are, are remain in the process for being changed. And um, we, we must constantly remind everybody that um, there's only so much you can do with uh, blended model data and so much you can do with having a consistent starting point. Um, when you've got weather changing and, and, and things aren't, it, it's not 100% uh, um, rocket science right now. It's not um, forecasting in the future is a, a little, little dicey to begin with. So uh, targets of opportunities remain and that's where we need a good co collaboration with our neighbors and um, any of any situation where that might not have gone smoothly or if it did go smoothly, go ahead and mention that in this for that feedback form as well and we'll, we'll take that in consideration. Um, as you'll see in the next slide, many of the responses are from deathbed offices that uh, definitely dominate, but um, all are welcome and definitely if you have something you want to bring to our attention um, and, and you're not looking for a direct uh, email back from us on that, um, go ahead and issue, uh, um, just submit uh, that feedback form and, and allow for uh, whatever time you need or whatever uh, length of, of discussion you need to put the, the details in there for that for that situation. Um, we did just recently add a place to an email just to be added to the survey if you do want a direct uh, response back from the team. Okay, I'm going to briefly go through this. This is an example of, uh, of what the, uh, the form looks like and how we're working on it. And uh, we've got it color coded and we go through there and we identify some of the issues that people are having and we kind of catalog them into where the more persistent issues are, are are occurring and that way we can keep track of how those issues are, are responding to any changes we might make to uh, try to address them. Okay. Okay, the, the next slide here. Uh, uh, Andy, does everybody have this next slide? You guys getting this? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I know the last time I tried to do this from home, my internet was so slow it, it really screwed up. But okay, um, as you can see, the uh, the responses we've got are, are by far dominated by the test bed teams, and um, certainly we've got a pretty uh, good range of responses. Though we've got about 30 offices, uh, um, definitely uh, close to about three quarters or, or more of our uh, central region offices have have responded with at least one feedback to to the team and um, helping us to evaluate this. And you can see that the, the test bed offices really stand out though with their feedback and. Um, there are some indications that maybe uh, the offices that are, are less than 100% satisfied with the process are, tend to provide a little more feedback. So we're really targeting um, some of those those uh, issues as well, particularly around the Great Lakes and uh, any of the mountain sites that have been working with us as well. We're trying to uh, um, make this work uh, well with them as well, as it does with uh, everybody over the, the, the plains and, and where the weather might not be quite so complicated when it comes to uh, particularly the, the, the resolution issues that, that the models tend to have. Okay, well the first question in there is, uh, did you have to make changes to the foundation grids? And then by far, uh, most people are saying they do make changes to the foundation grids that they receive from their common starting point. And um, that, that's definitely a good thing. We're, we're encouraging if, you, if the forecaster sees that changes need to be made, uh, go ahead and make those changes. Um, ideally, you get into a situation where the, the forecast comes in pretty well and you might not have to, and there's a large time savings there if you don't have to change those uh, foundation groups. Particularly now that as you make uh, significant changes, you, you need to coordinate with your neighbors as well. Okay, now this question is a little more uh, in depth to what we're trying to achieve here. Um, we actually asked how satisfied were you with the snow and ice accumulation amounts created by the uh, forecast builder. And um, so far the, 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 the feedback has been uh, coming out as, as definitely on the, the satisfied to very satisfied range of the, the, the 
the scale here, but we do still have a significant portion that are, are somewhat dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. And a lot of times when we have the uh, somewhat dissatisfied and very dissatisfied, we dig deeper into those uh, responses to see if there's any comments in there about what might be uh, causing trouble or what they didn't like about the results they received out of the uh, forecast builder. Um, well, another thing to note is that this is kind of an unconditional question. We did not uh, limit it to only times when there are snow and ice accumulations, so that could have skewed these results. Um, on the other side, though, there were 220 uh, not applicable comments on this, so that probably accounted for those situations as well to a certain extent. Okay, um, another thing we're asking about is uh, particularly for the uh, experimental teams, the, the, the officers working on the, the official full version and the ones that are in the experiment uh, properly, um, is the general satisfaction of the weather grid that they do receive from the forecast or basically the final step, uh, everything's all put together and it, it, it uh, comes up with your, your weather grid. Um, and in, in general, the satisfaction lines are, are, are higher on, on, on that side of the scale. Yet we still have a significant portion that are dissatisfied with uh, many modifications or widespread modifications needed by the time they're done with that. So again, we go through those particular responses and try to figure out um, if there's something that we need to adjust with that or maybe uh, try to hit something a little harder on training. And for instance, that's one of the reasons why we hit the, uh, the sleet possibilities uh, during a partially melted uh, a snowflake situation there to uh, um, we, we were seeing some feedback in there that, that suggested that actually the, the forecast was working as it had been designed, but the forecasters really weren't expecting that to be the outcome. So we wanted to make sure we get that uh, again um, during this uh, presentation. Okay, one of the key uh, findings of this uh, experiment too is we're looking into whether or not this process can save time when you are working with your grids and, and produce uh, those grids and the result that you want in a shorter amount of time. And so far, it does appear that, that most um, forecasters are finding out that, uh, yes, it does, but there is a significant chunk, 40% uh, nearly, that suggests that it, it is not. So we need to really target that those areas as well and see if we can come up with ways to uh, make it work more efficiently for, for those forecasters. And then uh, one thing we'd like to look at is that whether or not a forecast builder made collaboration easier. And um, uh, a significant uh, um, a percentage agree that forecast builder did make collaboration easier, and probably uh, along with that, of course, is the common starting point of uh, making forecast, uh, making collaboration uh, easier as well. Okay, and then uh, we do ask questions of whether or not, when whenever you get in a situation where you have to use the top-down grids, whether or not you need to make changes to those top-down grids. So we are seeing a, a fair number, and certainly uh, the, the vast majority. Um, not need to make changes to those grids, and and that's a good thing as long as you're getting the the, the results you want. Um, if you're not getting the results you want, um, definitely that's the place to to make those adjustments there. So uh, we see we've got nearly 20% of the time people are making adjustments to that, and and hopefully that's improving the forecast and the output that they, they get at the end. Okay, well I think that's all I have for the the feedback. Uh, I don't know if you want to pause here, Andy, and we'll take some questions, or we can go right to the the, the next uh, section. Yeah, I wanted to add one one more thing. Um, something your office can can do, um, you know, if, is uh, one thing we did. One thing we did here is not was not part of the te tech order or anything, but we set up just a simple uh, simple cron thing to put up a banner at like 3:15 a.m. p.m. Uh, to say, you know, please fill out the forecast builder feedback form if uh, you know if time allows. Uh, I think that. It, it, it's good just as a nice reminder, especially when you get into some, you know, a little more active weather and you, you know, want to, you know, those are definitely the times when you want to know if this process is, is working, working well for, you know, working well for your office. Um, yeah, I wouldn't mind, uh, yeah, pausing at this point. Uh, if anybody has questions, uh, please, you know, please raise, raise a hand there on your uh, go to and I'll unmute you. Just scanning, scanning the list here, making, making sure. Oh. All right, Brett, there at Riverton, got you un unmuted. Hey, Andy. Um, uh, i was just curious whether the grid management team is making any progress with um, pop stuff since the last tech order. Um, 
as you noted in that last email thread I had with you and some others, uh, we've noticed some big differences, big changes. Um, and so just wondering what the direction is, is heading for the next yeah. little bit. Yeah, again, it's a kind of a two-part, two, certainly a two-part thing here for the uh, yeah for the mount for the mountains. Um, the uh, the one one is the you know the incorporation of that neighbor that that neighborhood pop looking at greater than three hundredths of QPF um, really um, really jacks up the you know can jack up the pops and uh, you know I, I'm going to show again some pop verification here mo momentarily, but uh, uh, you know. You know, one thing we've had plenty of complaints. Certainly, out out east was too low of you know too low of pops. Um, and then I know for again for your mountain offices, you know, uh, Paul Wallen down there is going to be and in Pueblo is going to be working to kind of adjust the um, that 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 dollar uh, pop smart in it approach to kind of uh, kind of a, a, attack this uh, bringing in this new. Uh, this new thing with the with the neighborhood pop, so and see if we can get that corrected for the for the mount for the mountainous terrain. So I think that would that should be you know that that should be coming shortly. So. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, I was just um, as you mentioned, I was just a little taken aback um, when you know realized that. Uh, all of a sudden, with that tech order, that neighborhood pop was the major player in super blend pop, and it never really got the information on that, um, nor the you know the tech order. I didn't, I didn't read it from there, and so, and then for for us, especially for us out here, to kind of in a way get rid of the 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 taller enhancement stuff was, we didn't know that was coming, so. Yeah. Uh, Jerry, do you have anything further you want to discuss uh, on that? Since, uh, on. This was all discussed on our last call um, that we were going to go with this neighborhood pop approach and that we were looking at it. And the, the idea of this really came from what they're doing, in fact, with the National Blend right now. I mean, the, the National Blend is training their data with this neighborhood pop approach. Um, so that's where this idea came. It's sort of getting us closer in line to what the National Blend Pops look like. Um, and, the, you know, this was all done mainly for the winter time um, when we have low-end precip, um, but we want to make sure we have a higher pop because of the snow, um, you know, the certainty with snow. So that is where the idea came from. Um, I mean, I guess I can apologize that maybe you didn't get the, the memo. I know we had talked a lot with Paul and um, Boulder um, about it. Um, Paul down at Pueblo and also uh, I think a forecaster up in Boulder. And we, through them, we made the decision only to do this through um, the, the winter season and then we'll revert back to what it was um, once the warm season rolls around. Um, since we haven't had a whole lot of testing involved there. Um, I mean, the eventual goal here is that we're going to hopefully switch over to what the National Blend is. Uh, but right now, we're all doing six-hour pops, and version two of the National Blend does not have six-hour pops. So version three will, and so at that point, that's when we're hoping to sort of switch over to the National Blend. Thanks, Jerry. Any other questions? Yeah, and I guess uh, the two uh, this uh, um, neighborhood pop. Uh, if you if you had cap if um, during the train that that training module that was released. Um, there's both the one on Pro Vice President, and then the one that came with the tech order. There was a uh, um, there was some mention about that in in that uh, again in that little little ten minute training thing. All right, uh, continue on. Let's talk on the topic of pops. Let's look at some verification. Uh, so 
So this is something just ran yesterday because uh, I was kind of curious to see how the uh, how the NPOP has changed things, if if at all here. Uh, again, this is picture on the right is our our domain because I'm going to use the ISD database uh, for for this as as what would be the forecast database in this situation. Uh, and then going to compare against the super blend and national blend. We're going to just use RTMA QPE as the observed, and basically going to look at reliability diagrams and where you want your forecast would be uh, would be right along the diagonal line to be perfect. So on all these uh, on all these uh, pop verification, I'll have four slides on this. The one the image on the left will be what was bef like December 6th to January 6th. And then on the right is January 6th to February 6th. I try to sort of pick a, a you know a 30-day period that where you know some offices had you know in the ISD domain had the new pop technique in place you know so at least maybe a good chunk so we could kind of compare. Uh, really, a, really a better time period would be like say January 21st through February 21st, but we're not there yet. But anyway, it gives you kind of an idea. Uh, red, red on these graphs is super, uh, super blend. Green is the national blend uh, version two, uh, and then uh, ISC. Um, so that's our you know, our forecast in, in blue. So, uh, interesting here on the 12 hour <laughs> a 12 hour forecast. Uh, super blend <laughs> did the best um, in terms of uh, reliability of the forecast, uh, and then a little bit of degradation as you went to the uh, ISP and the national blend. However, as you get towards 72 hours out, uh, you know we're pretty much, you know, and sort of might expect this. Our forecast running in line with where the super blend is uh, because of the uh, because of the forecast builder cron strategy, and then uh, the national blend there lagging. So you know we're definitely making improvements here over uh, over the national national blend. Again, there's another. Pretty big improvement coming with MBM version three uh, in in the pop department. Looking at 100, uh, 120 hours out, uh, you see the same you know same thing here. In fact, uh, even in instances you know pre you know you go pre uh, you know January sixth there uh, when we had like 60 or 70 pops, they pretty much all verified as you know something that should have been you know the, the categorical term uh, suggesting you know, we were kind of under forecast in those situations uh, then you you know with the new pop new pop technique uh, we're more you know a little more in line there with where we should you know, where we should be and then even going 168 hours out uh, you know doing you know a you know, sample set of course uh, drops with the number of uh, high pop events but you know you even look at that whenever we've uh, you know Put in a 60 or 70 pop, both pre-January 6th and and you know up to here February 6th, we're pretty much right in line where it needs to be. So uh, I think that's good to see that what what's going in the forecast for <laughs> uh, for these higher higher pops. You know it's it's pretty reliable. Um, there's been some uh, not shown here in this webinar, but I've seen a few images of some of the national blend uh, version. I think. I think I don't know if it's version two or version three, but their pop pop forecast uh, in western up for western region uh, look you know these higher pops that the national blend would put out in the days four through seven period are verifying uh, as they uh, as they should be uh, in terms of along that raw that diagonal reliability line. So uh, I guess if you you know if you see those higher pops out there in days four through seven, you know don't <laughs> you know realize that they actually do verify pretty well. All right, with that, I'll open up for some comments. Uh, we do have an updated image here of the forecast builder participation. Um, so I guess you know let us know if this is not correct for your office. Uh, again, we've got varieties of feedback uh, mechanisms. Keep them you know keep it coming. Uh, as Chuck was showing, uh, you know, it, it's great info. Helps us improve the improve the project, and we're, you know, you know, changed quite a bit as noted earlier from where we were uh, at the beginning of the experiment.
yeah, open it up. Anybody uh, have questions? Uh, I'll unmute you if uh, you know, just raise, raise the hand and I'll do that. All right, still scanning. I'll, I'll wait here for about another minute. See if anybody has. You know, any any comments for anything from forecasters, you name it. Anybody? Yeah. All right. Well, uh, this is the end of the webinar. Thanks again for all for all attending. Uh, we'll probably have another one coming up here in another couple uh, another couple weeks. Uh, yep, keep the feedback coming. And thanks again, everybody. Yeah, thanks Andy. Um we'll we'll go ahead and put out the recording.